Well, good morning again, church. God is good. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. God is good. Indeed, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. And He is good because everything that He does and everything who He is is perfect. Okay, well, um, I want to uh, remind, get you kind of get you right here in the, in the stuff that we are doing for this morning. I want to remind you that we are in a series of sermons which we have entitled Jesus and Your Problems. And the main idea, I want you to pay attention to this, the main idea of the series of messages is that Jesus not only came to die for your sins, we all know that that's the main reason Jesus came to earth, isn't it? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. But Jesus not only came to die for our sins, but he also came to help you with your problems. Okay? So today we'll be looking at the topic of dealing with pride. Last Sunday, we were, I was sharing and preaching on the subject of dealing with worry. So the title of the message for today is, Dealing with pride. I want to remind you, and I basically, I don't know if it's a reminder or if, if it's a reassurance for you guys, but this is where my heart is this morning. If any of you would tell me today, Pastor John, when it comes to pride, I really don't know. Pride is not an issue for me. Pride is not a problem for me. Pride has never been a struggle and a temptation for me. With all due respect that I have for each and every single one of you, I would say this, I don't believe you. Because I don't think that there is one single person in this room here today who is not prone to fall into the sin of pride. In fact, I would say that we will be prideful if we would think and believe that we are not predisposed or prone to the sin. And because of that, because we all have a, a, a predisposition, a, a bent to do what is wrong, and in this case, to boast in wrongful and sinful ways, and I want to tell you this morning that we are all in desperate need of God's help. And that is starting with me and continuing one by one with each and every single one of you. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our struggles. You know our strengths and you know our, our weaknesses. And God, you know how prone we, are, we all are when it comes to the sin of pride. God, I pray that in the following minutes, once again, through your holy word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will speak to our hearts. That we will not be stubborn. That your word will find in our hearts good ground. Fertile ground, that we will be accepting your word, that we will be soaking your word, just like a, a, a sponge soaks water when we wash our dishes. And then as we hear your word, Father, I pray that you will give us the willingness, the desire, the hunger to be doers of your word and to let your word do its job in our hearts. Stretch us this morning. Challenge us, encourage us, mold us more into the image of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but I'm hot already, and I didn't even start preaching. Man, it's hot in here. Is it, is it hot or is it just me? <laughs> anyway, it's usually hotter up here than it is down, down there. Here is the, the outline of the message for this morning. We'll see three important things about pride. What does the Bible say about pride? How does pride manifest itself? I want to know that too, because I want to avoid it. And then towards the end of the message, 
we will look at how do I overcome pride? How do I overcome it? How do I fight it? How do I stay away from it? So first of all, I want to start with, with the idea of how, what does the Bible say about pride? You know, the Bible has a lot to say about pride. In fact, anything that you want to know, if you want to know how to be a good uh, worker, if you want to know how to be a good student, if you want to know how to be a good mother, if you want to know how to be a good father, if you want to know how to be a good child, if you want to know how to be a good servant, if you want to know how to be a good whatever you need help with, all you have to do is look in the Bible, in the Word of God. And in the Bible, we have the answers to, more, to basically all the problems and all the questions that we have. I want to remind you again this morning that the Bible has a lot to say about pride. And if I would be able, because that's my goal, to be able to stay away from pride, to be able to defeat pride, to be able to, to be clean in the eyes of God and in the eyes of men, if I would be ever able to, to be equipped to fight pride, then I want to know what the Bible says about pride. Well, to begin with, I want to tell you that the Bible talks about two kinds of pride. The Bible talks about godly pride, which is good pride. And the Bible also talks about ungodly pride, which is sinful pride. Let's start with the first one. Let me give you some examples of what a good pride is would be. For example, having satisfaction in a job well done, I believe that that's good pride. I'll give you an example. You dream about a project. You see a need in your home and you feel like doing something, building something. And you dream about it, you put it together in your mind, you get the stuff that you need for that project, and then, man, you start working on that project. And you work a day, and you work two, and you work five, and you work a week, maybe even you work a month or two months or three months. And at the end of the project, you are able to look back and look at it and say, man, man, you know what? This is good. This is good. I am proud of myself. I am proud of my effort. I am proud of what I was able to accomplish. Is there anything wrong with this pride? I don't think so. I like to call this good pride. Let me give you another example of what a good pride would be. Being proud to be an American, and I cannot say this loud enough. Being proud, since we live in America, okay? Being proud to be an American is good pride. I am one of the very few people this morning who was not born in the United States of America. My wife is downstairs right now. I don't see her here. She's teaching uh, children's church. But I do see uh, uh, Nanai. I do see our mom here. So if I am not wrong, as I look around, maybe just me and her right now in, in, in the main sanctuary, we have not been born in America. I was born in Romania. At the age of 15, I came to the United States of America. In 1998 along with hundreds of others, men and women. I stepped foot on a stadium in Phoenix, Arizona. And before a judge, before a judge, we pledged allegiance to the flag and to the republic for which it stands. And I became a naturalized American citizen. That was almost 20 years ago. I still have the paper at home. I have the picture on the document. Boy, was I young. I looked at it just a few days ago. A young man with a little mustache here, if you can imagine that. We were mustache in high school. And man, I am telling you, if you were there on that stadium that day, you would have seen about 500 men and women who were proud to be naturalized American citizens. And I, John Todor, I, I don't think I'm wrong. Uh, off by saying this, I was probably the proudest man of all that day. Because I knew what it was like to live in Romania under the communist regime and to be oppressed. 
and not to be able to, to, to have as many Bibles as you want in your home. And to be told by the communist on Thursday morning when you went to school, where were you last night? Well, I was at church. We had prayer meeting. Get in front of the class. And endure mockings and insults and being kicked in the butt and being called names. I knew what it was like. But at the same time, by coming to the United States of America, I knew what it was like to live in this great country and to enjoy the freedoms that we are enjoying today. And I was a proud man in 1998 when I become, became a naturalized American citizen. And I am a proud American citizen today. I am. So I want to take a moment since it's the 4th of July weekend and you know me. I am me and you have to put up with me. I, am my, I just want to be myself. You know how? How strongly I feel. I am not a politician. I never want to be a politician. But you know how strongly I feel about these issues. I want to take a moment right now and to reemphasize as an immigrant. An immigrant is speaking to you right now. Don't be ashamed of being an American citizen. Doesn't matter what others think and say. I want to uh, emphasize and challenge you. Teach your children. Teach your children the American history. Teach them. Teach them to respect the flag and to honor the flag. Teach them, teach them to stand up and to honor the flag. And when the national anthem is being played or being sang, teach them to stand up and to honor that national anthem. There are so many men and women who sacrifice their lives in order for me and you to have this freedom and to be able to fly our flag in front of our house. Amen? Amen. 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 Teach your children nothing wrong with being proud, in this case, to be an American citizen. The Bible tells us that we need to give Caesar what is Caesar's, and we need to give God what is God's. Amen? Let me give you another example of godly pride. I would say that godly pride is, or good pride, is taking pride in your family. Nothing wrong with this kind of pride. I don't think so. You know, parents being proud of your children, children being proud of your parents, husbands being proud of your wives, wives being proud of of your husbands, doesn't the Bible say, you know, that we ought to, as husbands, we ought to honor our wives? So it is okay to say, honey, I am proud of you. Honey, I thank God for you. I am proud of you. So it is okay, it is right, it is perfect to encourage people and at times to even say, tap someone on the shoulder and say, I am so proud of you. By the way, Apostle Paul in the New Testament repeatedly, so many times says, he writes to the churches and he says, I am proud of you. I am proud of how you are growing. I am proud of how you are witnessing. I am proud of how generously you give of yourselves. I am proud of you. When I look at the First Baptist Church of Casson, when I see what God is doing in my life and in your life, when I see the difference that you are making in this community, I cannot help but say, I am proud of you. That's good pride. So understand, please, this morning, that there is a good side to pride, and then there is a base, excuse me, a wrong side to pride. There is good pride, and then there is sinful pride pride or a negative side of it so let's go into the ungodly pride what is the ungodly pride what is the sinful pride I want to start with a definition what is pride it is what pride is pride is to show yourself above others with an arrogant estimate of one's means or merits despising others or even treating them 
with contempt. It is being conceited. By the way, the Bible has a lot to say about the sin of pride. Let's consider the manual. Here are just a few references for you that you can take home. Isaiah 2 to 12. Write this down if you want to and, and study it more when you go home. Jeremiah 9.23. Proverbs 11.2. Proverbs 16.18. Proverbs 29.23. Now here is what Proverbs 6.16 6, to 19 says. I know that most of you know this passage so well. Here are some explicit things that God says about pride that we need to pay close attention to. These six things the Lord hates. Man, when I hear this, I don't know about you, but all of a sudden I'm, I am on guard. <laughs> the Lord hates these things that we are going to read next. So I better pay attention to these. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now listen, the first one on that list, the first one on that list is what, church? A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swept in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and the one who sows discord among the brethren. Man, notice please that God chooses on this list, even before murder, even before murder, there is the sin of pride. It's not that murder is, is less severe than pride. No, that's not what it means here. But if you want to look at it this way, on God's, ten, top, on God's top ten list of things, the number one thing that is listed on God's list is the sin of pride. Proverbs 8.13 says that all who fear the Lord will hate evil. That is why I hate pride says God. Arrogance, corruption, and a perverted speech. So it is very clear this morning that God hates the sin of pride. God calls the sin of pride an abomination. And I was talking to the Lord this week and I said, God, why do you hate the sin of pride so bad? And the answer that I got from the Lord was this. God hates the sin of pride because of what pride does and that leads us into the second point of the message i want to know what pride does i want to know how pride manifests itself let me give you a few uh, things that you can write down if you want and how pride manifests itself first of all i will say that pride prevents personal growth if you want to be stagnant in your walk with the lord if you want to be one of those stagnant uh, people at work, if you want to be a stagnant student and not grow and develop, then just boast with, with how much you know, and I guarantee you that you will not be growing. You will not be growing. I want to show, and I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago, and I, I, I want to share a little bit more this morning on this. Uh, I told you like three weeks ago that God gave me the privilege to to attend a uh, chaplaincy program in Roseville, Minnesota. I did not have to go there. My credentials as minister were enough in order to be considered a chaplain to help here on the chaplaincy program in Dutch County. I did not have to go there, but I prayed about it and I came upon the internet upon this class and God gave me such a burden to go there and I said, I'm gonna go there. So I went there, I was in class, from Monday to Friday, 8 in the morning till 5 in the evening, many ministers there, many people who work in the church. Remember one of the, one of the lessons, I think it was on Wednesday morning, this lesson went for about three or four hours, was on communication. Remember this is a chaplaincy program. A lesson on communication, and we were told, and I knew this already, that as part of our communication, Good communicators are good listeners. Good communicators are good listeners. So before the instructor went into this topic of uh, listening and being able to communicate well, she asked us, we had two instructors, they were taking turns, half of the day one, 
the other half of the day the other one. And it was the lady teaching that morning. I will never forget this lady, one of the best, best, best teachers I ever heard in my entire life. So she asked and she said, uh, by a raise of hand, she said, I want to know how many of you in class this morning, we were 24, I believe, or 25, how many of you think that you are good communicators? My friends, every single one of us raised our hands, including the one in front of you. I raised my hand up and high because I was thinking I love people. I love God's people. I love to hear their hurts. I love to help. I am a good communicator. Man, she taught for about three hours that morning, three, four hours that morning. At the end of the class, and I'm sure that like me, every single one of them felt the, who were there felt the same way. I felt that John Todor, and I'm not ashamed to admit that this morning, John Todor has some way, and maybe even a long way, to go in order to be a good listener. She asked us, how, how many of you think that you are good listeners? That was the question. How many of you think that you are good listeners? And we all raised our hands. And at the end of the class, I learned that I have a long way to go in order to be a good listener. There were some exercises that were given to us one-on-one, -on -one, one talking for one minute, the other one listening, and then we took turns. And God worked on my pride that morning, and I realized that I'm not a great listener, that I have to make some improvements. My friends, pride prevents personal growth. Don't fall into this. Here are a few other things. Pride causes hypocrisy instead of authentic living. Remember in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said about the Pharisees that everything that they do, they do in order to be seen by men. Right? The Pharisees were not living authentically. They were just putting on a show in order for men to see it. That's what pride does. Pride always leads to fall. You know the verses. Proverbs 13 says, says that, that, that that's what pride does. In fact, let me say this. I believe that there has never been a war, never been an argument, never been a fight, never been a church split, split in which somehow, that somehow that event, that thing that happened was not rooted in pride. Pride promotes dissension. The Bible is very clear with that. And we all know who the author of dissension and, and strife is, don't we? His name is Satan. This is what James, why James says in James chapter 4, verse 6, that God opposes the proud. But what does he do instead to the humble? He gives grace to the humble. So, don't let pride be your guide. Let me share now with you a few marks, a few things that you can look at and see how you can measure yourself against these things and maybe make some changes. Something that you can answer in your heart and please let the Holy Spirit work on you. Do you, here are some questions, have a strong desire to be admired or noticed by others for something? I mean, we all want to be respected, don't get me wrong. We all want to be loved. Nothing wrong with that. But when you go out of your way, when you push your way and push people in the process in order to be admired and to be noticed, my friend, that is pride. Do you talk too much? Proud people don't tend to be good listeners because they think that what they have to say is more important than what anything anybody else has to say. And I notice that proud people cut people off. Because as someone is speaking, and we have to be careful with this, as someone is speaking, I am already in my mind thinking and getting ready to reply right away back to what that person is saying. And in the process, I'm not paying careful attention 
to what that person is saying and I am cutting them as they are speaking. Proud people talk too much. Here's another one. Do you find yourself boasting? Do you take credit for the abilities that God had given you? If so, then that's a sign of pride. You know what, I, and I'm still working on this. I'm working on this with the power of God every single day, and I have a long way to go. But I learned this a few years ago, that it does not matter. In the end, it does not matter who takes, who takes the credit for something. It doesn't matter whose idea it was in the end. If, if, if we are working on something and it was, it was my idea and, and God has given you the ability to be up here and to present that idea better than I do and people understand that somehow, you know, you are the, the, the leader of that project, even though it was my idea, more power to you. As long as the job gets done and God gets the glory, that's the most important thing. Here's another thing. Do you serve with a selfish ambition or in a spirit of self-advancement? If yes, that's a sign of pride. Do you seek the approval of people rather than the approval of God? If yes, danger right there. That's a sign of pride. We are accountable to God first and foremost. We ought to live in peace and unity with everyone, with people. But our ultimate approval comes from God. And in the end, I want to hear from God the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Whether or not people praise me for what I've done or mock me and didn't give me the credit for what I've done. It doesn't matter. It's God to whom I give the ultimate account in the end. It is another thing. Do you find yourself, do you find comparing yourself with others? If yes, that's a sign of pride. Our model is Jesus Christ. I said this to myself a long time ago. There will always be others who are smarter than Pastor John, stronger than Pastor John, being able to preach better than Pastor John, being greater pastor than Pastor John, more power into them. I pray for them, I cheer for them. My comparison is not them. Now I learn from them, but my model is Jesus Christ. And I ought not to compare myself with anybody. It is another one. Do you have a spirit of unteachableness? Because you already know all the answers. If yes, then that's a sign of pride. In fact, I do know in my life, and these people make me uncomfortable. They make me very uncomfortable. When I come across people like this once in a while, in which men, you know, whatever, whatever the situation, they already know the answer. And boy, their answer is always the best. You better listen to them. I don't think so. We all have a lot to learn from each other. Amen? It is another one. Do you always want things done your way? Man, that's a sign of dictatorship right there. My way or the highway? No, not in the body of Christ. Do you see yourself as being indispensable? You hear once in a while people say, man, if I wasn't in that ministry, if I wasn't leading that thing, man, everything will fall apart. I don't think so. If God is behind the ministry... And that church is built on the sure foundation, which is Jesus Christ. That church will not only survive without you, but that church will thrive without you. Because Christ is the great shepherd. And he is the author and finisher of our faith. Glory be to his name. Amen. Amen. Serving is not a right. Serving is a privilege. I am not indispensable, and neither are any of you. Amen? And it is another one. Do you look down on others and show little tolerance for differences? Remember in the Gospel of Luke, I believe it was in chapter 7, 
there was one Pharisee man, one Pharisee who was criticizing Jesus because there was this sinful woman who did not fit his pattern that was taking care of Jesus right there at the feet of Jesus, washing his feet and kissing his feet. And if anybody had the right to be at the feet of Jesus, to be near Jesus, boy, you better believe it, it was that Pharisee. Not that sinful woman with a sinful past. My friends, we have to be careful. We are all sinners. And we are all on the way to damnation, to hell. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? Amen. There are people who may dress differently than you. So what? Not everyone has to dress like me. There are people who may have a color of the hair that's different than you. Purple. That's all good. I'm not going to be... If you are a potential to come to Christ, man, I want to know you and I want to befriend you and I want to share the gospel with you. I'm not staying away from you. There may be someone with a ring in his, in his nose. Oh, what do we do? Stay away from me. No. No. Proud people look down on others and show little tolerance for difference. I have a, a, a challenge here for you this morning. Don't, don't be that way. Don't let pride be your guide. Okay, so how do I overcome it? Let me share with you a, a few things on how we can overcome pride. Number one, most important thing that you can hear here this morning. Confess your sin to God and repent from it. Amen? In the scripture, and I'm sure you guys have noticed this, in the scripture, in the Bible, I've noticed that every time someone gets close to God, then they immediately start confessing their sin. Because you cannot get close to God and remain in the same sinfulness that you were prior to getting close to God. I'll give you some examples. Uh, Job, in the book of Job, Job tells God at one instance, he says, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And here is what Job says next. Therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. When Isaiah saw God in a vision, remember Isaiah chapter 6? The Bible says that he cried out. He cried out, he cried out and he said, There's woe to me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people with unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the Lord God Almighty. Apostle John tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I'd like to encourage you this morning to start with this. Confess your sin and repent. Repent from it. Here is step number two. How do you overcome pride after you confess and repent from your sin? Then you consider your salvation. Consider your salvation if you want to defeat pride. What does Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says? For by grace you have been saved. Oh, wait a minute, God. Not by my performances? Not by how good I am? <laughs> Not by how, how, how great I can do things? No. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works. So that no man should boast. The idea is that you are not saved by anything that you have done. But simply by God's grace. And God's love for you is based not on your performance. But God's love for you is based on Christ's finished work. On the cross of Calvary. Amen. And last but not least. You overcome pride. By considering the cross. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. Apostle Paul says. May I never boast. 
except in the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My friend, there is room for us at the cross. And by the way, there is no room for boasting at the cross. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in one of his books, writes this, and I want to quote this for you. He says, there is only one thing that I know of that crushes me to the ground and humiliates me to the dust. He says, and that is to look at the Son of God and especially to contemplate the cross. John Stott writes in one of his books, and here is what he says, I'm quoting him. He says, every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to be saying to us, I am here because of you. So the bottom line is this, if you want to defeat pride, you must look to the cross. And there is a, hymnal that, a hymn that we have in our hymnals that reads something like this, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss. I love that, this hymn. I believe Isaac Watts wrote this hymn. And poor contempt on all my pride. And verse 2 says this, Forbid it, Lord, that I might boast, or I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Forbidden Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charred me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. At the cross, sing it with me, church. At the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my son rolled away it is there by faith I receive my sight and now I am happy all the way for I received from the Lord what I also delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself and then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I am to examine myself. You are to examine yourselves we are to consider the great sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. I would like to ask Brother Larry Sugar to stand.